Started. Webcast has started. Right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this Hask meeting in October. Um, I must remind you that it is a virtual meeting in public uh, of the Health and Social Care Select Committee, otherwise known as the Hask. And this meeting being held remotely and is being recorded and is broadcast live via the County Council's website. So the first item on our agenda is apologies for absence. Do we have any apologies for absence? No, very good. So now uh, for the benefit of uh, people logged into the webcast, uh, will you please, as I call your name, uh, just say present or make some utterance so we know you're there. So, um, Councillor Andrews, Good morning, Chairman. Councillor Boyles. Present. Councillor Briggs. Good morning, Chairman, and I'm present. Thank you. Councillor Carew. Councillor Carpenter. Present, Chair. Councillor Cooper. Yes, good morning, present. Councillor Craig. Good morning. Councillor Dowden, we know you're present, here. Present, Chairman. Councillor Franken. Present. Councillor Harrison. Here. Councillor Hare. Present, Chairman. Councillor Keast. Councillor Keast. Good morning, Chairman. Uh, good morning, Councillor Keast. Councillor Penman. Good morning, Chair. Councillor Thornton. Morning. And Councillor Vaughan. Present, Chairman. And Councillor White. Present, Chairman. Right, and that also means that we don't have any uh, deputies attending on this occasion. Uh, you're, it's, a, it's a full house, so thank you all for making it. Now, can I welcome also uh, Councillor Liz Fairhouse, who's member of Adult Social Services, and Councillor Judith Gryaski, Executive Member for public health. Uh, Liz, Judith, are you both there? I'm here, Chairman. Yes, and I'm here also. Excellent. Welcome. And I also welcome uh, Marie Manville, who's Secretary to the HASC from Democratic Member Services, and she's assisted this morning by Samaya Hassan and a newcomer to Member Services, uh, Rhys Pugh, who is observing as part of his induction programme. So thank you. And we also have, um, instead of Jenny, we've got, uh, I don't know, is, is, are you there? It's Nicola Thomas in the Legal yes, Department. you are there. Thank well, you. Thank you. Welcome as, as well. And finally, a welcome to Mr Hill, if he's logged in looking at the webcast. Right, item two is declarations of interest. All members who believe they have a disclosable pecuniary interest in any matter to be considered at the meeting must declare that interest. Furthermore, all members with a non-pecuniary personal interest in a matter being considered at the meeting should consider whether such an interest should be declared. Are there any declarations of interest? No declarations of interest, thank you. So now item three, minutes of our last meeting on the 14th of September. First of all, are there any omissions or amendments from anyone? No, there's a tiny, tiny amendment on minute 214. Uh, we've got the wrong use of its. So you delete the apostrophe and close up the T and the S. Now, we, we, now, know, we now need to consider whether um, the minutes are accurate and therefore can be signed off in due course. Are we happy with the minutes? Anyone not happy? Anyone abstaining? In that case, we can agree the minutes of the last meeting. Thank you. Now, matters Chair, arising. Chair, just before you yes, move sorry. off. Sorry, Chair, just before you move off, um, I just wanted to, to um, say something, if I could. Uh, it's Councillor Craig. 
Yes. Um, or do you want to finish the minutes and I'll come in after? Yes, I, if I may, I'll finish the minutes and then we'll come back to you. I, I, I know uh, the subject of what you want to talk about and I'm very happy that you do, but we'll, we'll, finish, we'll finish my script first, if that's Thank okay. Thank you. <laughs> right, so matters are rising. This is re-minute 214 on deputations, which you'll find at page four in your ModGov files. Members will recall that following a deputation at the last meeting, there was discussion of the reporting of Southern Health NHS Foundation Trust of their out of area beds figures. Following the meeting, I sought clarification from the trust regarding their figures and received a satisfactory explanation. This has been shared with you by email. And as indicated in the minutes under 219B at page seven, the trust will be next invited to provide an update on the out of area beds and the use of beds from other providers in January, 2021. Are there any other matters arising from the minutes from any of the HASC members? No. Okay, uh, Councillor Craig, over to you. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I spoke with you briefly this morning um, because I thought it was quite important that it was brought to this meeting after um, an incident I had last night. Um, my, my daughter, as many of you know, has had health issues on and off for, for a long period of time. And um, last night I found myself having to phone 111. Um, she was uh, in quite a lot of pain and discomfort um, with other issues, which I won't actually go into now. But I called 111 at um, midnight um, to have a call back at 20 past one to say that they were um, struggling to get back in the two hour frame, um, but just to rest assured that somebody would contact me. Um, I sat with her till 5 a.m. this morning um, because I finally managed to get her to sleep, um, but she was sort of having little, little jerkies during the night, which I was worried about her fitting. Um, and to have a phone call at one minute past nine this morning, from an out of hours doctor to tell me that they'd closed the case and if there were issues to go to the GP. Um, <laughs> raises lots of concerns and I think that we need to bring it to the HASC meeting um, because I'm concerned of the pressures that are being put on 111, um, which then you have some of those that could be um, a bit more anxious that end up in A&E, which then put people in A&E as well as themselves at risk. Um, I think there are bigger issues and I have had some complaints, which, you know, now, now I've experienced it too. I think there are some real issues. So I would like to, to be able to, if we can, call in 111, find out what the pressures are, what we can do to help um, and try and help those um, patients that need the help to get it. So thank you for letting me in, Chair. Sorry, I was a bit premature. I'm, like I said, a bit tired. Hopefully I'll make it to the end of the meeting. But if I don't, please, please excuse me. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Councillor Craig, for bringing the issue to our attention. I know it wasn't part of the agenda, but given what you have said, there could be a general concern here, and I'm sure that uh, our officers will make some inquiries to make sure that uh, the 111 service uh, is getting the help that it that it needs. So thank you for that. Thank we you. can now we can now move on to. Uh, Item four, deputations. There are no deputations. So now, uh, Chairman's announcements. I've, I've got three announcements today. And the first is that I'm saddened to report that Councillor Alison Finlay, a district councillor of Test Valley Borough Council and co optee on this committee, passed away suddenly in the week following our last meeting. On behalf of the committee, I wish to place on record our thanks to Councillor Finlay for her service to this committee. She has served on the HASC since 2011, some nine years, and I express the Councillor's gratitude for her valuable contributions, including those she has made also to her community. We also, of course, send our condolences to her family and friends. At this point, I'd like us to show our respect for Alison's life by observing a minute's silence.
Thank you, everyone. My second announcement is on safeguarding concerns. Members will note we have an item on our agenda today on adult safeguarding, which falls within the remit of the HASC to have overview and scrutiny of the arrangements in place to carry out the Council's statutory responsibilities around safeguarding adults. I'd like to clarify that it is not within the remit of the HASC to investigate individual cases. And should anyone have safeguarding concerns about an individual, this should be reported to adult services using the numbers published in the County Council's website or the online form to report their concerns. Safeguarding referrals are triaged by the multi-agency safeguarding hub known as the MASH. A complaints process is available for dissatisfaction with service received in an individual case. And then members have been emailed with further details on this. And my third announcement concerns deputations. Please may I take the opportunity to remind those present of the County Council's deputation rules as set out in the Constitution. Committees or standing panels of the County Council shall receive deputations at any meeting relating to business that is properly within the agenda for such meeting. The total time taken by a deputation in addressing a meeting shall not exceed 10 minutes. Any deputation which has appeared before a meeting of the County Council, the executive, an individual executive decision day or any committee or standing panel of County Council shall not reappear in any such meeting or any other meeting or individual executive decision day within a period of six months on the same or similar topic. No discussion shall take place with the presenters of a deputation, but the chairman of the meeting may inform the deputation how, if at all, the matter will be dealt with by noting action or referral. Deputations in respect of individual service concerns will not be received where, in the opinion of the Chief Executive, in consultation with the monitoring officer, the subject matter of the deputation relates to issues which are more properly dealt with through the County Council's corporate complaints procedure, or which might cause the County Council to breach confidentiality rules. Thank you. Now, uh, at this point, I just want to say that we're going to be joined at uh, around about 11 o'clock by Susan Cunningham for item eight. She's going to speak uh, on the New Forest Birth Centre, but she can only stay for half an hour. So we need to slot her in between 11 and 11.30. So we may have to jump around the agenda. So I hope you'll bear with us if, if that situation arises. So now we can move to the substantive part of our meeting. Uh, Item six, uh, which is public health COVID-19 update. Now, we've got three items that uh, address COVID. And what I'd like to do is take them in series now. And then at the end of the third presentation, we'll then go into questions and debate because very often there are overlapping issues across the different um, areas that the, that the presentations cover. So if you're happy with that, I'd like to start by inviting uh, Simon Bryant, Director of Public Health, to give us his update. Simon, are you there? Good morning. Can you see me? And I've shared a presentation, if that's helpful. Thank you. We can see you and we can hear you. Great. And can you see my presentation? And I can see your presentation. Excellent. So I'll just go through... Uh, this presentation uh, talking about COVID and talking about some of the issues uh, around COVID from a public health perspective. As, as uh, Councillor Huckstep has said, I can take questions uh, after the uh, other presentations. So, uh, I say struggling to click through. There we go. So, this report uh, provides information on the COVID pandemic in Hampshire. I'm providing some information about the data. Uh, obviously, the data is fluid and dynamic, so the data in your report will be out of date because of the number of cases. And I'll talk a little bit about deaths and some of the actions. So uh, if I move on to the next slide, you can see uh, the pandemic epidemic curve. 
Just to, <coughs> excuse me, just a few things to point out. One is in the first wave uh, in April here on the left, this was testing, which was called pillar one. So only people admitted to hospital and then people working in health and social care. So with the, the rise on the right, that includes community testing um, and uh, testing of people uh, with all symptoms. So a different type of test, but it's just worth bearing that in mind. Just to bring you up to speed, uh, within Hampshire, in the last seven days, we've had 642 new cases, bringing our total, uh, bearing in mind what I said about pillar one and pillar two, uh, to 8,063 cases. That is a weekly rate of 57.9, which compares to England, a rate of 168.5 for the last seven days. And we look at the last seven days because it's really important to understand where our uh, infections are going. And just for context, within the northwest of England, the rate, seven day rate is 369.1. I would also just like to emphasize cases are going up across the county. So whilst we are lower than other areas of the country, we are seeing an increase in cases of uh, coronavirus. So this looks at, um, across the Hampshire districts. If I can just talk through this graph really carefully, uh, what you can see there is on the left hand side of the graph, uh, you can see the cases uh, going up and um, you can see them plattered off in the middle and then they're going up again on the right. It's really important to remember that places like Rushmore and Baines had really good testing at the beginning. So it's worth looking at the little uptick on the right hand side rather than particularly uh, looking at uh, the rate from the first wave. But we can see there's rates uh, increasing across all districts uh, with, as you say, uh, Rushmore uh, having uh, been the highest, partly due to the first wave, partly due to being close to London uh, and factors such as that. When you look at infection rates uh, across England, you can see that red northwest and uh, the northeast patch. And we can see uh, down in the south, southeast, we are uh, doing well with our cases. So that just gives you the kind of country context uh, of where we are. Really important to look at death rates, uh, just to say that death rates are lagged. So the data on deaths uh, require the Office of National Statistics to look at that. So we can see in the middle of the pandemic, we had that excess deaths, the red bars being those from COVID. Uh, and now you can see that our excess deaths rate is slightly lower than our five year weekly average for this time of year. So we're keeping an eye on that. And you can see it does, um, as I like to say, bubble up and down but we're keeping an eye on that and we'll do that, as I said at the last cast, making sure we've got a long-term view. So the latest weekly deaths was three. Just thought I'd highlight some of the key public health actions. So our local outbreak engagement board, chaired by the leader of Hampshire County Council with a wide membership, including the executive member for public health, executive member for uh, adult services, and executive member for children's services, alongside uh, the leader uh, of Basingstoke and Dean Council, uh, and also a non-executive director uh, from the NHS. And that's supported by a number of officers. So the things we've done uh, under the uh, oversight of the Health Protection Board, which I chair, we're preventing and managing infections and incidents in a number of schools and settings on a daily basis. Really important that we do that, and that's working well. Uh, we are going to see outbreaks and cases, as you're aware, and we've um, you know, we work with the school to make sure they uh, support the right pupils to isolate. It's not always that the whole bubble needs to isolate. Uh, and we're working with other settings, depending on the, uh, the where the cases are, that might include, um, well, we're definitely working with care homes under the leadership of Graham Allen, but also uh, other settings uh, such as workplaces and community settings should be required. And we're doing that on a daily basis. We're increasing our communications, uh, doing a lot of comms. I think, uh, you know, I'm very grateful to the communications team for taking that work forward. Um, I, I haven't managed to get the, the background that Councillor Huxley has got. I've got that uh, in my portfolio, but a lot more comms for the community to ensure that the messages are clear around rule of six, social distancing, face coverings. Um, and we're doing specific occasion messages. Uh, so thinking about bonfire night, Halloween, um, really carefully thinking about Remembrance Day, so that the message to our public and our partners is really clear what we expect and what we need to manage um, 
the uh, COVID uh, pandemic. We've got uh, an increased testing capacity. So I think I presented last time that the lab capacity nationally was uh, not meeting demand. That is now uh, much, much better. It can always be improved, but actually the lab capacity is improving and the turnaround time. So the time from test to result is also improving. So that's really positive. We've increased our local testing sites um, uh, across Hampshire. So we've got five that are uh, either built or being built and some more in the pipeline. And that enables people to access testing uh, quickly to be able to understand uh, the situation they are um, they're, they're, whether they're positive and what they need to do. And for completeness, we've issued two legal directions. Uh, and that was uh, for two fairs, one in the New Forest and one uh, in Alsford, uh, where we as a health protection board uh, were not assured that this would not provide, would not increase the rate of infection in those local areas. And so therefore we took uh, the legal direction to close those two events. We take those things very seriously, but it's very important. I will stop there, Councillor Huckstep, but as you say, happy to answer any questions uh, as required. Councillor Huckstep, you're muted. Oh, quite right. I'm trying to follow the rules myself. Uh, yes, you should be able to hear me now. Uh, we can move on to the next presentation. Uh, which I think is going to be given. Simon. Hello. Uh, you, I, obviously, Simon Bryant asked for questions, and I'd like to ask a couple of questions if I could. Uh, Councillor Dowden, what, what we've agreed is we'll ask questions after all three oh, presentations okay. have been given, because the, often there's overlapping. So I think That's it's the most efficient that. thing to do is to listen to all three, and then we can go into questions and uh, uh, any necessary debate. OK, Thank so you. The, 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 the next presentation uh, is going to be given, I think, by um, Councillor, sorry, by Director of Allot Social um, Care. Uh, that's Graham Allen, and he's going to be assisted by Sarah Snowden and Jess Hutchinson, I believe. Yes, indeed. Graham, Thank you, Councillor Huckstep. Good morning, uh, members. Um, I'm going to be uh, joined uh, by Jess Hutchinson and Sarah Snowden that will talk us through uh, the first set of slides to provide an update in terms of our welfare and uh, also our recovery responsibilities and the actions. I will then take us through uh, a brief overview in terms of the care home situation. And again, as Simon has said, happy to take questions once the presentations have been concluded this morning. So at this point, I'll hand over to uh, Sarah and to Jess. Good morning. Morning, Jess. Welcome. Hi. Thanks, Graham. Hi, I'm Sarah. I'm just going to take you through the first couple of slides around our recovery and response arrangements. We updated you last month on what we were planning. So this is just a brief update to show the activity over the last month. Uh, we stood down the bronze operational response structure within adults on the 3rd of September to put the focus on to recovery. But we've also we're running a shadow bronze alongside. So rather than completely close that workstream down, it's a shadow bronze of which I chair with a colleague of Jess's. I also chair recovery to ensure that the activities are still being planned, although it's not as active as recovery. So what we've done, we've had um, if if the shadow bronze is stood up quickly at Graham's instruction or other other instructions from the organisation, then we would immediately stand that team up. So the shadow bronze would become the main bronze and recovery would become shadow. We would quickly flip the recovery exec group to be the COVID exec group to manage um, and govern that activity. We have departmental service resilience plans in place now for all areas and action cards developed, which have been tested with the teams to ensure that they are workable, the resources are available. We mentioned previously about the stop start models, everything we started or everything we stopped, they have all been reviewed and updated in this period. And we have also collated all the information we require on the ad for the adults department, should we need to use the corporate redesignation scheme, which will be a CMT um, discussion later. 
So we're pretty prepared. We're, we've done an extremely good job. Um, Graham is feeling very assured. We have all the leads and deputies ready. They have been well communicated to. They know the actions that they need to carry out. We know that we can stand up elements of response while continuing with elements of recovery. So it will not be a complete switch. We will do the actions we need to in terms of response so we can do a phase transition if required. We have arrangements in place for monitoring compliance with Care Act duties during this time. We have plans in place to stand up the welfare team. That's 50 um, FTEs that have actually been identified by name, are ready and able to do seven day working on a rotor system to stand the welfare team back up. We've got to focus on ensuring, ensuring those that were reliant on the food parcels have access should they be required to shield again. We've renamed and refocused the, um, the helpline to be the Hampshire Coronavirus Help and Support Line with um, clear referrals into Mind and Citizens Advice. Updated the marketing campaigns for It's OK to Not Be OK, which is a focus on mental health and well-being, and It's OK to Ask for Help. And we're also working with Jess on a campaign to help older residents become more digitally enabled, which we think is a key driver for this activity. I'll hand over to Jess quickly. Thanks, Sarah. So at the same time as all of that preparation for response, we continue to work on recovery. Obviously, um, financial recovery is an important strand that can't be underestimated. Um, members are aware coronavirus has had a significant impact on adults health and care and i'm pleased to say that our savings programs are now fully resumed um, and financial recovery is an area that will be fully considered by cabinet in november um, as members are aware some services such as day services and respite services had to stop during the the um, wave one peak and lockdown and we've been working hard to reinstate these this has generally been successful. All HCC day services and respite services have been stood up again, um, although, of course, granted with reduced uh, capacity. Um, and we've reopened over 50 younger adults um, day services that are commissioned, for example. But it's also important to note, I think, particularly given the context that Simon has described, that uh, the, the context of rising infection, that we want to retain as a priority that focus upon infection control and supporting providers with um, outbreak con control mechanisms. Um, we are supporting day service providers right up until the end of the, this um, year with regard to um, payments to make sure that we, that, that we sustain services well. So, one of the things then that, that we really need to continue to focus on is around workforce recovery. So very important that we support staff who to do their job well, given the, the pressures on them currently. Um, we have a staff wellbeing hub that we are continuing through to March 2021. We're regularly engaging with staff to check how they're doing, particularly given the, the, the different working arrangements at the moment. and. And, and, and doing that in a really proactive way. The other thing that I think is critically important at a time like this and continues to be something we're focusing on is lessons learned. So wanting to continuously improve, improve and adapt as a result of what we've learned from these, these um, unusual circumstances. Um, Graham, as Director of Adults of Health, Health and Care and um, Chair of the Care Governance Board, is pivotal to that. So there are a number of different pieces of work going on, including involvement from Hampshire Safeguarding Adults Board, the Hampshire um, uh, Care Review of our own HCC care services um, during Wave 1 is continuing and that review is making good progress. There's been reviews across the whole of the market that have been brought to Care Governance Board for um, assurance and, and we will continue with those kind of um, examinations in order to make sure that we're doing all we can and continuously improving in that regard. Thanks Jess and Sarah. So members, I'll just take us through a few slides in terms of uh, the situation across our care homes uh, in Hampshire. And just to remind us, uh, there are some 480 care homes operating across Hampshire uh, with over 12,000 uh, beds in total. 
So just in terms of, of the care home sector, and, and Simon uh, in his earlier presentation identified uh, the number of excess deaths, and those excess deaths, 1,200 that Simon reported, were across all care settings, or across, sorry, all settings in Hampshire. Uh, the reference here to excess deaths, and indeed the total number of deaths in care homes, are purely around care home uh, sector. So between the 28th of February and the 2nd of October, some 3,312 people in care home settings have died across Hampshire. When we look at that number and compare it to the five year uh, rolling average, some 800 of those deaths are considered to be excess, i.e. higher than the number that we would usually expect to see. And of that 800, approximately 500 of those uh, people in that excess death uh, group have died with COVID-19 being identified and cited on their death certificate. In line with comments I've made previously uh, when presenting to HASC, work is ongoing to understand uh, how those excess deaths uh, came about through uh, both infection into care home settings, but also the non-COVID uh, 19 related excess deaths as well. It's not a quick or a rapid piece of work, but it's a very important piece of work. And Jess referred on her uh, presentation just now to lessons being learned and a, a variety, a series of reviews taking place across a number of uh, sector uh, boards to understand and they will be brought back to this uh, board in due course once those reviews have had the opportunity to conclude and arrive at some findings. Overall across the sector, we've worked very closely uh, from the beginning uh, of the pandemic. So we established uh, very early on in April, uh, working arrangements more closely with Hampshire Care Association, which is a representative body for all care providers across the County of Hampshire. Uh, whilst the number of, of uh, social care providers across Hampshire total uh, almost 1,000, there are approximately 270 social care providers that are part of Hampshire Care Association. So it is uh, the representative body for care providers across the county. They've routinely been undertaking surveys. The most recent survey that they undertook uh, concluded in July of this year and uh, based on the responses they had, and they had 62 responses uh, to that recent survey. And the recent survey was asking providers a series of questions in terms of their confidence and their thoughts around uh, financial and business viability going forward in particular. And those 62 responses identified that those providers had experienced a 22% increase in their costs. So that's their operating costs. And that arises from a whole range of measures, including uh, increased uh, cost and utilization of, of personal protective equipment, increased staffing costs. And that's borne out just uh, both by staff that have needed to self-isolate and bringing in additional capacity from their, their workforce or indeed agency staffing uh, to make sure that, that um, uh, service user care could be continued in a good and positive way. And I think this is the, the starkest uh, point that falls out of that survey, certainly for me, that of those 62 providers, 92% of them were reporting concerns over their future, future financial viability. Now, slightly more positively, in terms of support that has been provided, uh, working, as I say, closely with both Hampshire Care Association, NHS C, uh, CCG colleagues, and Healthwatch Hampshire, and the CQC. We've been working closely in terms of support that's been provided uh, to the wider sector, but specifically for the purposes of this presentation to the care home sector. So through its commissioned care, so that's to say the, the care that we directly commission and pay for, pay for through Hampshire County Council, some 16 million of additional financial support has been provided to uh, social care providers across Hampshire. It's also worth pointing out that the increases in commissioned care that we've paid to those providers that we uh, directly commission. The NHS 
have through the CCGs followed suit in terms of care that, that they directly commissioned and indeed have enhanced payments to those providers too. We also had uh, the first wave of infection prevention and control grant funding from government. That was some £18.4 million that was received by us in two payments that immediately went out to the sector in both May and July. And very positively, we've had returns from all providers in terms of the use and the utilisation of that funding in order for us to make returns to government. On the 1st of October, the second uh, amount of infection prevention and control funding was announced and indeed we are currently making payments of uh, 7.8 million. Again, that 15.6 million referred to on the slide is needing to be passed to providers in two payments, one in October and a second in December. We are literally, as this meeting is taking place today, processing those payments of, of 7.8 million again out to the sector. In terms of, of where all this brings us, there's a huge amount of activity, as you've heard already. There are a whole series of local reviews in terms of lessons learned, making sure that our services remain uh, resilient as we go forward and poised and ready to act as required. Alongside that, for the first time ever, the Department of Health and Social Care has published a requirement for a social care winter plan. And we need to confirm to, back to the Department of Health and Social Care by the end of this month that we've got actions underway in all of those required areas. And it requires things of us, it requires things of providers, and it requires things of us working closely with NHS colleagues in terms of discharge routes and support across the sector. I'm pleased to uh, be able to say to, to HASC that having undertaken a review of all of the actions that we've got underway and that established uh, through the first uh, initial responses uh, to this pandemic, that we're in a positive position with regard to all of those requirements uh, to the social care winter plan and a positive response will be submitted to the Department of Health and Social Care uh, in the course of the next few days. Beyond that, we've uh, over the course of yesterday uh, submitted a response back again to the Department of Health and Social Care around market stability and resilience alongside every other local authority in the country, which will help hopefully to inform future government and Department of Health and Social Care support for the wider sector. And we've needed to uh, identify any clear risks and again mitigations that we're taking with regard to local market conditions. In line really with what Simon said earlier, some of the issues and risks that we've previously uh, reported here are around uh, testing regimes, national testing regimes. We have seen improvement around uh, the timeliness of test results being received back. But members, I think it's fair to say there are still some challenges. The test results, whilst they're coming back uh, uh, at an improved rate than we had been seeing, there is still some way to go in terms of the responsiveness and the timeliness of those weekly tests for staff and those monthly tests for residents. Alongside that, we're also, of course, entering flu season. And there are plans that are in place across the whole of the sector, both from a health and a social care perspective. There are some national uh, challenges at the moment in terms of the availability and indeed some of the logistical challenges over uh, getting those vaccine supplies out to services so they can be administered. But again, I want to reassure HASC, we have plans in place across the whole of the health and social care sector. At this moment in time, it's a logistical and supply challenge and we're working closely uh, with national colleagues and plans being in place, we hope over the course of November and into December, vaccinations will be uh, rolled out and made available to all sectors of our community. I'll stop there, but thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Graham, and thank you, Sarah and Jess. The next uh, block of uh, presentation comes from our NHS colleagues. Uh, so uh, I'm going to invite Sarah Tiller 
who is the uh, managing director of Fairham and Gosport and South Eastern Hampshire and Hampshire and Isle of Wight Partnership of Clinical Commissioning Groups. Uh, Dr. Andrew Bishop, who is um, Hampshire and Isle of Wight STP Clinical Transformation Director and Consultant Cardiologist at Hampshire Hospitals NHS Foundation Trust. And I don't know whether she's joined us yet because we're 20 minutes to go before 11 o'clock. Um, Suzanne Cunningham, who will be uh, hopefully with us, uh, she's Director of Midwifery, University, University Hospital Southampton, NHS Foundation Trust, um, and she will be talking to us about the new birth center. So, uh, can I ask uh, Sarah to speak, please? Uh, morning, everyone. Um, actually, um, we are joined by Andrew Bishop, and um, as he's the clinical lead for uh, a, load, a lot of the programs that have taken place across um, Hampshire in order to restore uh, fundamental services, I thought it would be helpful if Andrew um, talked us through the paper from a clinical perspective. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Chairman. And uh, ni nice to see many of you again, and uh, particularly nice to see many of you looking so well. Um, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of old friends and a lot of old patients. So uh, uh, nice to see you again. Um, uh, could I start by just, it wouldn't be right not to reflect my concern hearing the story that we heard earlier on about the 111 situation overnight. Um, and I'm sure that Sarah will want to take away on Maggie's behalf just to find out a bit more about what's going on there. I know that our urgent and emergency care services are under a great deal of pressure at the moment, but also uh, that's, that, that doesn't feel right, what I heard. Um, no, and actually, and Andrew, I totally agree. I did put my hand up at the time, actually. So if Councillor Craig would like to contact me offline, I'm very happy to take up the um, the personal um, story that you relayed and, and get to the bottom of that, because that obviously isn't right. <laughs> um, I know it was actually a very busy night last night um, in certain areas, but obviously that's no excuse. So yes, of course, um, I definitely will uh, will do that. Um, Marie, perhaps you could pass our, uh, exchange our details. Yeah, Thanks, and Andrew. It, and thank you, Sarah, for that uh, in intervention. Uh, and if there's anything personally I can do to help with the actual situation, of, of course, I'd want to do that. Um, and uh, Chairman, you, you, you have a paper there. The, the specific focus of this is what we call phase three. And what I'd like to do is to describe where we are with that and then really put that in, put, put some real life into that and describe the challenges of where we are at the moment. Um, uh, in particularly in health, but in health, health and social care, uh, we've described the, our, our experience of the, pan, the COVID pandemic in phases. And you'll remember that the, that the first phases were those where uh, we concentrated almost exclusively on the response to the COVID infection um, uh, in all of our sectors and, <clears throat> and, and maintaining some urgent critical services. Uh, phase three, of course, was a national description of um, as as those services as, as those demands were, were waning, um, the challenge of restoring other services in in health and social care, and particularly in healthcare, uh, and there was a program uh, nationally to do that, which we, we which was described as restoration recovery, uh, and we had uh, an obligation and also. Um, uh, a large program of work to restore those uh, our services. Uh, I will remind you that uh, there, there were specific targets for that, and these were largely driven around trying to get back to services, whatever they were, um, in yeah, to, to where they were before. And so, therefore, they were targets which were set against uh, pre previous activity, and so were measured as percentages. Uh, and that program phase three came to an end with a submission in terms of the planning earlier this month. Uh, and our plans were by and large um, well constructed and well received. Just to give you an idea of the detail of those, they concentrated very much on two areas. Uh, the first of which was the restoration of what's called planned care in uh, primary community mental health and, and the hospital sector. Uh, and planned care was the thing that, of course, was most 
challenged by um, the experience of COVID. And that just, just so we understand what that is, that's people coming to hospital for outpatient appointments, and particularly that's patients coming to hospital for tests and then for operations. And, and clearly they were, they were very significantly impacted over the, over the summer uh, by the COVID experience. And the targets for phase three were that most of those should be uh, restored to 100% of what they'd been before, uh, but recognizing that there was a particular difficulty at the moment in providing inpatient care and operations because of the residual issues around uh, infection prevention and control. And so that target was 90%. I'm happy to say that we collectively submitted plans which were almost compliant with that. Uh, in one in one particular area, there was a challenge, and it was the challenge that in the University Hospital in Southampton, there is a, by, by virtue of their particular uh, focus on uh, maintaining critical services, they were slightly delayed in restoring ordinary services, uh, but have plans to have all of those uh, uh, at 90% by, uh, by by November. And by and large, we have uh, succeeded in doing that so that uh, whether it's outpatients or whether it's uh, diagnostic services in hospitals or whether it's day case procedures or inpatient operations, hip replacements, what have you, we're beginning to get back to that. And the, uh, our plans have been compliant with that. I think what we what, what's important to recognize is that's a very specific, a very specific ask and that there are three things which are really important to understand as a background to that. The first of which is that that plan involved a significant amount of investment and it's been a, a, a difficult discussion, uh, the discussion about investment, but I'm pleased to say that we have largely concluded that. And I, I would comment that that investment has been uh, disproportionately into community services, which we see both in the short, medium and long term as a, a major focus for uh, expansion and development in order to um, balance the services that we have at the moment. Uh, and so that is phase three and we're in the process of trying to do that. I think what we need, what we recognize is that uh, phase three concentrated very much on mental health uh, and then on planned care in hospitals and therefore was not directly concentrating on all the other important areas of, of, of what we do in health in, in health care uh, in primary care or in community services or in the urgent emergency care that we deliver uh, and what is true is that uh, in all of those services restoring simply to um, where we were before is not really good enough because of course you will be very well aware that where we were, were before was quite balanced and that there were challenges uh, and that challenge is, is particularly true uh, now, so that we are not only trying to restore to targets, but we're trying to restore to a situation uh, which starts to remedy some of the, the, the deficiencies of the services before the, 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 epi the epidemic. So we are very well aware that whether a people's experience of primary care, people's experience of mental health, people's experience of community services, people's experience of hospital services are not where we would want them to be. They are not uh, as as good as we would uh, uh, have expected before the pandemic, but of course before the pandemic there were areas where we were struggling, uh, and I think that is most acutely felt. I think actually in in, in mental health, uh, and one of the issues we are already cited on is the fact that restoration with investment into mental health doesn't get us close to a situation that we feel stable and and, and will want to be. And there are many specifics that you may want to talk about that. I think the the other the, the most important thing to recognise, though, is that this this programme of restoration and recovery of services was predicated on on the assumption that um, the specific demands of COVID and of uh, urgent and emergency care in hospitals and in primary care were um, ha had waned, and therefore we could concentrate on 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 getting into uh, the backlogs that had, that had arisen. Um, but that we are not quite in that situation now because uh, urgent emergency care has become very, uh, very active again. And all of our uh, hospitals and, and uh, general practices are reporting that they are really, and you'll have reflected that overnight, really, that they're coming under extreme pressure. And that is, to be honest, in a situation where the demand, clinical demands from the COVID pandemic are still very modest. And while uh, Simon has shown you the the large number of cases around the uh, the difference this time and last time is that those cases are not 
uh, translating into high levels of activity in hospitals uh, at the moment. Although, of course, we are well aware that then, uh, particularly with the experience in the north, that that may be a temporary phenomenon, and we are we are are are, are, are resilient to that. I think the 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 most pressing issue about uh, the residuum of, of uh, restoration recovery is the issue about people who've been on waiting lists, because a large number of people who are on waiting lists for routine procedures um, found during the COVID response uh, that those wait that those waits became elongated, uh, and we need to recognise that while before the pandemic, uh, although some of those delays were unacceptable they it would be extremely unusual phenomenon for people to make wait more than a year for treatment and of course a year is already something that feels pretty grim uh, uh, the 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 consequence of effectively those patients not being treated at all over the course of uh three or four months meant that there are now a large cohort of patients waiting for routine care uh, typically for routine um operations uh, who are now waiting more than a year and actually to to be candid about it that number which was probably on count, counted on two hands and a couple of feet prior across Hampshire the Alawite before the pandemic that is now in its thousands uh, and uh, uh, the projections are that, that there will be a, a hump of those but that that hump will be several thousand and already there are somewhere around about 5,000 people waiting there and we are very very urgently working to work, working to, to try and create capacity uh, in order to cut into those backlogs. The challenge, of course, of that is that that's, that's occurring at the same time as the increase in pressures in urgent emergency care and the anticipation of needing to work uh, to work differently in order to accommodate COVID. And so we are in a very difficult juggling situation at the moment where we are trying to restore services, we're trying to address the backlog that has occurred and we are trying to ensure and create resilience for winter and for the, uh, uh, the, the, the prospect of there being a significant demand from COVID-related infection. The, la the last thing I'd like to draw to your attention is that um, uh, there has been a change in which health, uh, particularly health, serv health services, but actually health and social care services work together rather than separately. Uh, and this has been catalyzed by the COVID experience. Uh, and traditionally, we, you would have you would have had uh, you would have seen different providers, whether they're GP practices or mental health providers or different hospitals, largely working as hard as they can within their local communities to to try and resolve pressures as they arose um, fairly independently. Uh, this clearly is no longer appropriate, and it was not appropriate in the pandemic, and is not appropriate now. And there is an entirely different way of working in health and social care, and particularly in the healthcare services, where both cooperation between hospitals and cooperation between general practices, co cooperation between community providers, and perhaps most importantly, cooperation between hospitals and primary care has entirely changed. Uh, and under this new, uh, the, 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 the new integrated care system that uh, we are forming, uh, we are operating much more collectively uh, and of course those problems are, are, are best dealt with and many of them are best dealt with in a coordinated uh, way at scale. Uh, we're learning how to do that because it's a cultural change uh, but it is exactly the right direction of travel uh, and so for example where there are extreme pressures just at the moment for a number of reasons around Covid infection and other things in, in, in North and Mid Hampshire and, uh, and Hampshire hospitals um, there is an active program of working out not how, not only how they will respond to those, but how the whole of the Hampshire and Isle of Wight uh, healthcare system can collectively um, help to respond uh, and plan to go forward to work in a much more collective way. There's a lot of specifics that people may want to ask about all of that, but but the summary I think would be that uh, the the very limited. Um, uh, uh, aspirations for phase three have been largely uh, successful. However, we are absolutely aware that that doesn't um, uh, mitigate the pressures of the backlog of patients who are now waiting unacceptably, the pressures of people trying to access urgent emergency care. 
uh, and and the challenge of the investment that is required to meet all of that against uh, uh, the, the, the the constraints of resources which are inevitable and 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 natural. Um, Sarah, I'll stop there. And Chairman, thank you. I'm and ha happy to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Bishop. That was a very comprehensive report. Thank you. Um, Sarah, are you going to do your part now, or has Suzanne arrived? And if she has, would it be prudent to do her first? So I, I think Andrew's covered everything that's in our paper. I'm very happy to take specific questions with Andrew, but um, I wasn't going to say anything over and above what Andrew's um, already outlined. OK. Uh, what, what about Suzanne Cunningham? Is she, is she here? Uh, is she in the waiting room or? Chairman, I can't see her as part of the meeting. Right. The... It's still four minutes to 11, so. I'm um, keeping an eye out. I don't know if you want to take some questions on. Off we'll, 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 we'll start questions now. And as soon as uh, Suzanne arrives, we'll take her presentation. So. Um, I've got a number of questions. I think the first one uh, must therefore be uh, Councillor Dowden, who wanted to ask a question much earlier. Councillor Dowden. Yes, uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, the first, uh, I'm going back to Simon Bryant now. Um, in Southampton, uh, seen it on the television and read about it, in the schools they're doing, oh, particularly one school, uh, where they're doing the saliva tests, where they're bringing them in, the pupils, and of course they can, you know, um, be able to uh, see the situation and if there's somebody who's got uh, any symptoms, they can get them out quickly, if you like, rather than infect the whole school or whatever. But I, I just want to, just with Simon, in regards of the testing, which I did ask previous at the previous meeting, because I had concerns about the national situation. And I know we're doing things now. We've got a new testing station in Winchester, I understand. And I know down at uh, Adenet Park in Nurslin, there's one there. And yet, can I ask, why is it, and this is not the only person, but in a local school to me, a child went in complaining of, uh, feeling ill so they were sent home quite rightly uh, and then sent for uh, us to organize a test and from here they had to go the other side of warminster to get a test and they could not child couldn't go back to school for nine days because they didn't get the test back for eight days i mean that is quite ridiculous when we have testing stations right close by and when I went down to Adenac, myself, Chairman, to see for myself the, the testing station, um, quite frankly, it, was, it wasn't hardly being used. It really wasn't. There was only a few cars there. This was on a weekend, agreed, but nevertheless, there was hardly anybody there. And I just find that ridiculous that someone sent the other side of Warminster. Can anybody, can Simon say yep. something about that? Uh, Councillor Huxley, shall I respond? Would that be okay? Yes, yes. please, Simon. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for your question, Councillor Dowden. So there's a couple of things there. So um, as I mentioned briefly, the lab capacity uh, has not been what we need it to be. So probably about six weeks to even four weeks ago, and it's improving week by week, uh, each test centre was capped on a daily basis. So if someone needed a test, the test centre was capped. So if they'd used their... Um, uh allowance of tests they someone had to go further afield we absolutely agreed and we pushed um politically and uh, to office level with dhse to say this is not acceptable as you say people had to travel a long long way for tests it was not right uh, so we we're doing a lot of work at that time to really ensure people could get tests uh, the school uh, was right if someone has symptoms they should be sent home to get a test if uh, the pupil was unable to get one. Each school was given a small, and I emphasise small, um, number of tests they could use if someone was struggling. They often use these on teachers to make sure teachers come back. So that was 
um, what happened. So what you did find was test centres looked empty because the lab capacity wasn't there to enable the test to be processed. Uh, that has improved dramatically. I know uh, now that actually people can get tests on the same day, uh, much lo more local to home, and we are improving, as I mentioned, the number of local testing sites so that actually they're much close to people's homes so you don't have to travel far. I absolutely accept it wasn't acceptable uh, for someone to have to travel that far. Uh, I suspect the person in question was during um, the challenging time of lab capacity, but that has improved dramatically. Okay, thank you. I'm pleased thank to you, hear that. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Dutton. Uh, next question from uh, Councillor Briggs, please. Thank you, Chairman. How many questions am I allowed to ask? Because I've been writing them down as you've gone through all the presentations. Uh, well, what, one per presentation, please, Councillor Briggs. Oh dear, that's an awful thing to have to choose. Don't, don't forget we have a procedure where um, if you have more questions, uh, we can collect them by email and then have them answered post-meeting. But answer, ask your most important and direct questions first. Okay, I think then I, I would choose Dr. Bishop, please. Um, yeah. My concern is here, it, it was such a comprehensive report that you gave. And I think that in one way you answered all my questions about how people feel, because everyone really appreciates what the NHS has done. You have worked all tremendously hard and I don't really want to criticise, but the way people felt during the pandemic, the height of it, was unless you had COVID, nobody was interested in you. And morally, I, I, I feel that it's a dreadful decision for you, but somebody could be very ill with COVID and people appreciate you're trying to stop the spread of infection but also someone who was equally ill with something else. You had to prioritise. And I don't know how you overcome that. Um, myself, I've got a husband who's been waiting for a cardio version since March. And that has been the main complaint, really. And I know you understand it. You've explained it very well. But my fear is that we go into phase two or phase three, what's going to happen to these people who've been waiting so long? Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I, you, you know, I, I understand that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it's, it's, uh, it is important to recognise that, that this, what we're doing now in terms of anticipating the winter, anticipating, anticipating whatever happens next with the infection, we have learned from that previous experience. And I think in retrospect, um, our anticipation of the demands on health service, uh, the health services was quite considerably in excess of what actually happened. And we therefore uh, stood down a large amount of access to care, both emergency care, to be frank, but also particularly elective care, uh, but that the hospitals and general practices were in no sense overwhelmed as a result of that. And in fact, they, they were often quite quiet. And so this time we are much, much more nuanced about um, trying to maintain uh, normal business and trying to deal with backlog at the same time as creating resilience. Um, now, of course, nobody knows what's going to happen. It would, what, what we would never want to happen would be that experience where we were definitely having to make choices between patients who were unwell. Uh, and we didn't have that experience before. But there is, as you say, a large number of people now whose access is not what we would have wanted it to be, and 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 as a result, is still not the case. We are we are we have much more detailed plans for uh, protecting routine services now than we did last time round. And one would say that one of the things that have been very very important around that is uh, learning how to use the uh, private the private hospitals that we have in the private sector as places where we can continue to do, uh, if you think, planned work or elective work because they don't have the same constraints about having to be um, uh, ready or prepared for, for, for COVID. Uh, but all of that having been said, I recognise exactly what you say um, and uh, I, I do it every day. I do outpatients every day and I know that people have been waiting and even now most of those outpatients are on telephone calls. So um, 
the, the struggle of trying to resurrect things while also trying to remain resilient against uh, the demands of urgent care is, is a great challenge. And I, I wouldn't I wouldn't say in any sense that we we, we got this proportionate and balanced first time round. Thank, Thank you, you. Bishop. Um, may I just, may uh, I just add quickly, Chairman, um, to, to Dr. Bishop, people won't now then be faced with the alternative that what was said to people was you need to go into hospital but it's the risk of catching COVID. So it's your decision whether you go or not. People who really should be in hospital, if unfortunately it happens again, won't have that dilemma. So it's their choice. Yes, and 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 just to be completely clear about that, although th that was that that was very much part of a national conversation and would have been part of individual conversations, the the clear message from general practice and from community providers, mental health, and also from the hospitals was. We have never said that we are not open for, for for business for need, and that if people need care, we we will do that. Um, there are constraints, but we never got to the situation where we had to say, "Sorry, we 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 are um, we're, we're closed if you need us," and that will still be the case. Um, uh, I know that many people will be anxious about coming into hospitals, and clearly, I can understand that. Uh, but we we would we would very much encourage people to continue to need to to to, to present if they need a, need need care. And uh, there is one other thing to say, and it, sorry for taking time, but um, we are also conducting a process of what we call validation of people waiting for care. Because what we recognise is that there are a number of people when we contact them who for for routine uh, care who say who have reservations about coming to hospitals at the moment, and so therefore we have now a, a, a facility for people to say I would like to continue to be on a list to wait to have this done, maybe my cataract done or my knee or cardioversion as you say, but I would rather wait until things have calmed down a little before that. Uh, and we do now have a facility and are proactively contacting people to have that discussion. Thank you, Dr. Bishop, for that reassurance. Councillor Briggs, uh, Suzanne Cunningham has now appeared. So can I stop your questioning at that point and we'll come back to you for your other two questions after we've heard from Suzanne. Suzanne, can you hear us? Hello. Yes, 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 I can hear you. Welcome. Would you like to give your presentation now? Uh, yes, I, I'm I'm happy to. Um, I've, I'm, my name is Suzanne Cunningham. I'm the Director of Midwifery Services at um, UHS and I'm the Clinical Chair for the Local Maternity System. Um, I've come to you today to talk about the closure of the New Forest Birth Centre on a temporary basis. Um, I have managed to keep uh, the service um, safe and open to both birth partners and part, um, birth partners uh, for birth and for postnatal care. So um, actually as a service we've done very well during COVID. We weren't in any way overrun, but we did have women with COVID. Um, the issue that challenges the maternity services is staff. So um, during COVID, I think we, you know we we had a number of midwives who were who were shielding, but actually as an organisation we we managed to continue offering all areas of birth. And to be clear, at the moment what we offer is a labour ward, which has got the full sweep um, of obstetric staff supporting theatres, and is is largely for women who have more complicated uh, births. Um, uh, we also have a, a standalone birth centre, which is the New Forest Birth Centre, which is for women having uh, low risk births, perhaps women who've had babies before, by and large, uh, but not always. And then we also have a, a midwifery led birth centre in the building uh, at the Princess Anne. Um, the challenge, particularly this last couple of months for us has been um, the schools going back uh, and consequently a number of children going into self-isolation and then of course obviously their families have to go into uh, isolation, catching COVID etc. So I think that's been a very big um, uh, stra strain on our staffing. 
And the second area is that um, we have had rather a rush of pregnancies and staffing pregnancies, not, I mean, we would expect the other pregnancies. Uh, but our staff, we've got a lot of staff pregnant at the moment and the advice up until this point for pregnant staff has been that once they're pregnant that they, they, they don't work uh, clinically face to face. So this sort of perfect storm of lots of things going on has meant that actually our staffing has been uh, largely reduced and after a number of different strategies to try and improve the situation um the safest way for me to be able to continue to deliver the services for Hampshire and the Isle of Wight was uh was to um pull our services into the one building at the Princess Anne and so I've uh put forward a paper to the to the board and to the commissioners around um uh closing the New Forest Birth Centre just to births so that I can have the midwives who would normally be doing the births at the New Forest Birth Centre at the hospital. Uh, it's a decision that's reviewed every two weeks and um, I'm happy to take any questions um, from the councillors if they, they have any. Thank you, Suzanne, uh, for that. Um, what I propose we do is we suspend the questions that have been lodged. I've got questioners, uh, Briggs uh, pending, we've got Councillor Cooper, Councillor Hare, and we've also got Councillor Keast and Councillor Vaughan asking questions of what we've already heard. So would you all like to put your hands down off the screen? And I now, I'm now taking questions directly on what we've just heard from Suzanne Cunningham, because she's only got another 18 minutes with us. So, are there any questions for Suzanne? I've got two hands remaining. Uh, uh, Councillor Vaughan, I think, first. Councillor Vaughan? Nothing from Councillor Vaughan. Right, Councillor Frankham. Councillor Frankham? Sorry, I raised my hand for not this one. Sorry, um, okay. it's not right. this section. Right, so are, are there any questions from any members on uh, Suzanne Cunningham's presentation? Doesn't look like it. Um, what is important, I think, Suzanne, from what you're saying, if I've heard it correctly, is that irrespective of whether uh, that the birthing centre in the New Forest is closed, you still have in Hampshire a global capacity to deal with any uh, forthcoming births. Yes, ab yes, absolutely. Yes, That's I do. I, in order to be able to address that, 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 that was the action that we took. It, it may be that location will be inconvenient for some families, but th that will be uh, the price that has to be paid in order to keep the service running. Yes. Fine. Uh, Councillor Carpenter, your hand has suddenly appeared. Do you now have a question? Yes. Thank you. I do actually. Yes, thank you. Go um, ahead. It's more of a, a clinical question, really. I, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just curious. Um, the parents that have come in, or the, the ladies that come in um, to give birth and caught COVID, have there been extra complications? Obviously, there there will be. Um, but I just wonder, you know, how are you dealing with? How have you been deal dealing with that big part of it? Yes, actually, I. Um, to be fair, we've actually seen more women with COVID in this last three weeks than we did in the entire first wave. And I think that just reflects that COVID is much more in the young people uh, now. Pregnant women are, um, are can, can be very sick. Uh, however, it, we haven't had anybody who has needed to be transferred. So we would normally transfer those women over to the intensive care department from the Princess Anne. Um, nas uh, nationally, it, it has has been a problem. There have been um, maternal deaths um, related to COVID, um, but uh, we haven't seen that sort of activity here. 
Has, has it yeah. affected babies? Just so, you know. No, babies are un, ba babies seem very unlikely to get it, even when they are with their mothers who have already got COVID. And the women who we have got coming through now are are unwell, as if they've got flu. Um, it's really inconvenient for them because they don't they don't feel great and they're going to labour, but they're but they're then they're not sick enough to leave our care and to go to the um, respiratory physicians. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Keith, do you have a question on this topic? Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, Suzanne, as I understand it, um, one of the main reasons that you're having to close the unit is because you've got staff pregnancies. It's not as though you don't have any notice of this. You have nine months notice. Can, are you not able to cover these staff well yeah. in advance of these, these events happening? Yes, well, well, normally we would have some notice. So um, normally we would have um, about uh, five months notice before they leave work. Um, but the advice at the time is that as soon as somebody finds out they're pregnant, that they don't work. Um, so, so immediately at five weeks pregnant, they were coming off the off duty as opposed to normally they won't leave work until maybe 36 weeks. So that's why it was such a different um, uh, a different situation for us. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Darden. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Uh, Suzanne, I was interested when you said that obviously young mums um, um, are actually uh, now suffering with more with COVID, if you like, than previously. Um, and you mentioned about the babies not getting it. Mm. Is it a case of, is there any difference if mums are breastfeeding or, or, you know, because that's normally a big issue? Yes, um, definitely at the beginning. I mean, we are pushing that even more so and we're, um, we're, we're clearer about our advice now because obviously we've got some experience and some evidence behind us. Um, but we would normally encourage people to breastfeed because actually the, that, that helps with immunity. Um, but of course, a lot of mothers are worried because they're very close to their babies mm. at, at that time. Um, and regardless of that, babies, the development of babies in the first few weeks is very dependent on seeing human faces. You know. Mm. Our, our brains need those pathways to be developed and a lot of that comes from interaction so we encourage women to do that and to not wear what masks when they're interacting with their babies thank you Suzanne thank you uh, Councillor Vaughan did, did you have a question or not uh, thank you Chairman I did but uh, Councillor Briggs sort of got in there before me but I just I just wanted to make the point to Andrew. My my wife has myeloma and she had two procedures cancelled earlier in the year, much to her great detriment. So I am somewhat underwhelmed by the process. But uh, Andrew, thank you. Your answer to Councillor Briggs certainly gives me some hope that fundamental services won't be treated like this in the future. Thank you. Uh, now, I don't see any more questions for Suzanne. So, thank you, Suzanne. You're 12 minutes ahead. Um, I'm glad we've been able to accommodate your narrow time slot and, and thank you for your contributions. Thank, so, you, thank you very much. So, members, we'll now revert to the stream of questions we had for the uh, presentations excluding uh, Suzanne. So, the first person I'm going to ask uh, for their question is Councillor Briggs. You're going to continue with two other questions. Thank you, Chairman. Um, can I go back to Simon, please? You said that rates were rising in Hampshire. What age group is, uh, have you got a record of what the age group is? And what preparations are we doing for, we hear it on the news all, all the time about long COVID, which is going to take a lot of um, time. Simon, are you there? Apologies, Councillor, I had to nip out. Can you just repeat the question or come back in? Apologies. Thank you. Yes. Um, you said that COVID is rising again in Hampshire. 
have your record of what the age group is, please, and what preparations are in place for people who are now suffering from the um, long term long COVID, please. And apologies, just uh, uh, had to go to another meeting there. Um, yes, you're right. We're seeing an increase in cases. What we've seen in this second wave is that the cases are generally younger. So uh, in that kind of 18 to 24 kind of age band, we're seeing more cases there. But they aren't affected as severely as the older population. But we are seeing those, the age band of um, the cases going up. So as in we're seeing more older people um, beginning to get coronavirus, which is why we're then seeing the impact on uh, hospital activity, as uh, Andrew Bishop will be able to share. So I think what we're really mindful of that because we um, we want to protect our most vulnerable population. But yes, we're seeing the age band going up, but it's younger than the first wave. And Andrew can talk about um, support for long COVID. It's certainly an issue that we're aware of, um, and we know that people are struggling. And it's you know how we manage this new kind of long term condition. Thank you, Simon. Uh, and your final question, Councillor Briggs. Thank you. That's to Sarah. It's about people who are shielding and they have food parcels delivered to them, which is very, very helpful for those who need it. But how do people who don't need the food parcels because they've got family looking after them stop the food parcels? I've had to return parcels and obviously I take them to the food bank. But people are told by the person who delivers them normally in a lorry that they've got to leave them. And these are people who really, really don't need them. Um, how, perhaps I should have looked it up myself, but how do they stop getting the food parcels they don't need? And so they go to the people who do. Thank you. I'll hand over to Jess for the second part, which is more, more the lessons learned from last time. I lead the data teams that manage all the information that comes through. And this time we've actually um, got a new process for the data that was coming through to us every day at about midnight, which we had to respond to in a really fast manner. And sometimes, as you experience, maybe that data wasn't in, entirely correct. So we've done a big lessons learned around this, looking at how we're managing that data and looking to make sure we do that triage in a, a more structured manner because we'll obviously have a lot more time, a lot more lessons learned. Uh, Jess manages the welfare team, and this is something that we had a uh, discussion around the other day around how do we ensure that people do not get either duplicate calls or food parcels that they don't require. And I'm just going to ask Jess just to finish off the answer because she's um, leading the welfare work stream and was very mindful of this um, issue last time. Thank, thank you ever so much, Sarah. So thank you, Councillor Briggs. The food parcels were delivered nationally, so they were arranged by national government. And I think, you know, that they, they had a lot to do. And one of the issues, therefore, was that they there wasn't a really effective mechanism to stop food parcels. But towards the end of the wave, we were actually through the helpline assisting people online to stop the parcels. Um, as you say, there was no route through the delivery drivers to actually be able to do that. So I know it was really frustrating. Um, it's part of that. Um, issue that a number of things with the shielded were delivered nationally. The great thing is that new guidance has now come out and in the future anything to do with food should there be, I hope, you know, if, if there should be a second wave will be delivered locally. So we will have more coordination ability and control if you like around around those types of things. The other thing is that we have priority supermarket slots now for people which are much more readily available than they were in wave one and we very much want people to have ultimate control over what they order and to be able to order it themselves rather than getting that very standard kind of national um food parcel that doesn't necessarily fulfill the the individual need so so a lot i would say a lot's changed and i don't think if something happens again where people need food that you will get the same kind of problems as we had in the first in the first uh, wave there. If Thank you I could, for your answers. If, if I could just add very briefly to that, what, what we know through the National Shielding Programme was that there was huge variability, not only in terms of the timeliness of uh, food deliveries, where people had requested a food delivery through the National uh, Shielding Programme, but also the quality of, of the food being delivered 
and indeed at one point during uh, the uh, spring and summer we were receiving as many calls from people subject to shielding asking for support to stop deliveries through the national program and indeed the national program uh, ceased delivering food at the end of July when uh, shielding uh, came to an end nationally. As Jess has just said, we've now got far more uh, local control over what may be required as we go forward. And you'll remember that one of the, the elements that we referred to in the presentation was around supporting uh, people across our communities, particularly older people, to become more digitally enabled. And actually access to supermarket priority slots is one of the key issues and one of the key reasons that we are working with a range of partners, community voluntary sector, district and borough council partners, to ensure that, that people are able to sign up and receive uh, deliveries through priority supermarket slots for that very reason, because there won't be a national uh, shielding program making food deliveries. But we are confident that we've got resilience and we've got uh, lots of activity locally taking place to be able to support people both now, but should the situation deteriorate and additional support is required. Thank you, Graham. Uh, next questioner is Councillor Cooper. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Chairman. Uh, my uh, question is to uh, Simon Bryant. Um, in the north of the county, which is funny enough where I represent in Rushmore, there is a, an increase in the rate of COVID infection uh, shown on your graph there. And I believe the, uh, the last figure I saw was um, 118 per 100,000. Uh, two points arising from that. Firstly, what are the trigger points, uh, especially with Rushmore in mind, and uh, also the Basingstoke area. What are the trigger points where we might find ourselves in tier two? And uh, is it possible to get a clinical view from this area as well? Because um, we've heard a lot of uh, interesting stuff coming from, from the south, but very, very little, in fact, nothing from my area. Um, Rushmore has a, a population of around about uh, 95,000. Hart has got a similar uh, population. Uh, and then if you look at Surrey Heath as well, which is our, our, our immediate neighbour, they've got a similar population. And we're hearing very little from the clinicians in the area. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, really interesting question. So uh, the rates for Rushmore um, this morning were 84.3 for the last seven days in uh, per 100,000. It's worth remembering that with the smaller districts, the numbers uh, kind of go up and down in a um, due to statistical variation in the way that cases uh, come through. And you're absolutely right to, to be thinking about that. Uh, we look at this very closely in both my daily meeting when I look at the data, but also um, in our health protection board to see what the best way to support uh, communities to prevent spread as I said, we are having cases rising all over uh, Hampshire and we need to think about how we do that. And so some of the things we're doing specifically, as I said earlier, is increasing testing and making sure the comms to those communities are really um, kind of well defined and clear so we can support all communities. I'm also aware because uh, Rushmore is nearer London and we see that kind of spread out from London that we are mindful that we need to particularly focus there. So we're doing a lot of a lot of work, which is why we've been setting up a testing centre in Rushmore for that reason, um, to help people and then to uh, work with others to help them self-isolate. So with regard to the triggers going up, uh, it, it's not an exact science, it's based on a number of things and uh, Councillor Manns, as the chair of the local outbreak engagement board, would be working with colleagues, uh, but he would uh, work with myself as the professional lead to uh, work out in line with government whether we should go up, but it's not a clear exact science as you may understand. Uh, those on the watch list uh, a month ago were, the rates were much lower. So it's kind of variable. It's based on a number of factors, including rate and spread of infection, um, positivity rate in that community, uh, how the NHS is coping and a number of other factors. So we look at a variety of things, but 
uh, we uh, would work together to understand should we need to um, uh, go up a level, that would be a, a conversation between myself and the leader, and then we'd make those decisions with national government. But it's not a not a, a kind of a figure that you're looking for. And clinically, uh, I don't think we see anything particularly different uh, in in Rushmore in terms of. Uh, I'm, not, I'm just wondering what you mean by clinically. We are seeing um, admissions to hospitals as we are across the whole of the, the county, small, but they're going up. Um, and uh, yeah, we're, we're aware of that. So uh, we work through all those kind of situations and working with people like Dr. Andrew Bishop to make sure that uh, we take into account anything um, that we need to with regard to kind of clinical factors within the NHS. <clears throat> Thank you, Simon. Uh, Councillor Hare. Thank you, Chair. Um, a quick one for Simon. Um, with uh, more test centres opening locally, if people have had um, a, a COVID test before and they're showing symptoms again, um, are they encouraged to have a retest? And will they be sort of retested or will, because they've already had one, they, they won't be? Uh, thank you, Councillor Hare. So if someone has had symptoms and goes for a test, quite rightly, and that's the right thing to do, and comes back negative, um, and then have symptoms again, say a month later, yes, of course, they should go for a test. However, if they've had a test and they tested positively, we wouldn't test somebody again, uh, because actually what you might find is there's kind of, as it were, residue infection in their body where they're not actually um, infectious because they've um, had an immune response. So uh, only if they've tested negative the first time should they go for a test the second time. OK, uh, next questioner is Councillor Vaughan. Uh, thank you, Chair. No, I asked my question. Thank you, you Chair. That was covered by your last question. OK. Uh, Councillor Keast. Thank you, Chairman. I think this question really is for Andrew Bishop. Um, I've had a bit approached by a resident in my ward because of concerns regarding contact with which was actually Portsmouth. Um, they originally had a consultation with the respiratory department in Portsmouth and we referred to the ear, nose and throat department. This was before lockdown since when they have heard absolutely nothing. They've had no reassurance, no contact from ENT at all. They have had contact with the original consultant on the respiratory department, and he can't help at all. He just simply says um, either, either they're not doing anything or they, they're, they're way behind. The, that, that, that particular resident is, I can't say, let's play concerned at the lack of contact. Surely, should there not be some sort of contact between the department and the resident, even if it's just to reassure them that they have got them on the list? <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Th th thank you. And two points there, and you are, of course, quite right. Uh, the first is to say that there are different specialties that have been impacted differently by uh, the COVID experience. And the five specialties that have found that have been most under pressure are uh, ENT is one of them, then it's, it's, it's ophthalmology, eyes, it's orthopedics, uh, people waiting for hip replacements, etc. It's dermatology and it's urology. And this, the, these are the services that are under particular pressure because they have large numbers of patients having procedures that are deemed to be relatively less urgent and therefore were differentially impacted. And it is true that that is that that is the experience. So ENT, of course, for ENT services, they were also doubly hit because uh, these uh, the ENT, rather like dentistry, was a particularly uh, infection risk procedure because of the um, uh, the, 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 the droplets, etc. Uh, so that, that's the explanation why it's difficult. Uh, of course, there's no excuse for not being in contact. And you are quite right that the part of the experience of being waiting is just not knowing what's going on. Uh, that's why we now have a program comprehensively to contact everyone who is on our waiting lists to not only just say, are you OK, but to discuss the options as they are at the moment, partly because many people will say, actually, I'd rather wait rather longer. But also, if, if things have become more pressing, we do have the flexibility to bring them forward. Uh, I recognise exactly what you say, and I think that experience is very common, that, that people feel uh, sort of lost and aren't able to find out what's going on. 
Uh, we are comprehensively trying to deal with that with the programme which covers everyone on the waiting list, which is about 110,000 people at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Next questioner is Councillor Andrews. Well, oh, thank you, Chairman. Um, it's a question about um, case testing data, uh, the recording of it. Um, just recently, a family were tested and the father was negative and the mother and child were positive. Three days later, the family were tested again and all were negative. Now, how would this be recorded? Would it be recorded as the positive or the negative? So that is one thing I would like to know. And my second part to that is what percentage of tests have a false positive and how does that affect the figures that we see? Thank you, Chairman. Many thanks. Um, really, really good question. So really, if someone's tested positive, they shouldn't be tested again, because actually, as you say, we do get a very small number of false positives. However, I'd rather have a small number of uh, false positives and false negatives. So it, it's worth remembering that um, d just the way the tests were, and I wonder why they were encouraged to have another test, because it wouldn't be in line with the protocol to get a second test. The family may require one because they've displayed symptoms. They would be described as a positive case because they've had a positive test. Thanks. Thanks. And, and did you have the percentage of false false neg false positives? I haven't got it on me. I think it's within less than one, really, really, really small. I mean, I can't, less than 1%. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Simon. Uh, next question is Councillor Frankham. Hi, thank you. Uh, my question is for Dr. Bishop. Um, hello, Andrew. Um, at the last house Hi. meeting, I asked about um, the ear, nose and throat, audio and lymphedemia. I've been to audio, so I know that's working. And I know a and &E is because I have now been booked in to go and have a scan with, a head scan with Dr. Blanchard. But there's nothing yet uh, as from the lymphedemia. Now, I know it's not a, not an urgent one, but it's um, it's quite uncomfortable uh, for people like myself that, that have this. And I just wondered, you were saying about getting back to normal. Yeah. Um, is is uh, Dawn Hill doing clinic? Because um, I and I've also phoned the foot clinic. And that just keeps on saying there's there's no foot clinic yet. So I just wondered that yeah, you know okay. about the ones that are maybe not as important, but um, are quite uncomfortable. Yeah, I I understand. Th thank you for that. I, I must just say what a spectacular background you have, by the way. It's quite quite diverting, the background <laughs> on your on on your teams. Um, yes, thank you. It's, it's in. It was my 75th birthday last week, so my son put up the balloons. So. It's a little unnerving. It's a little unnerving because it's very slightly looks like a COVID. Um, <laughs> the the, uh, the the answer is that, that, that to my knowledge, there are now no, none of the services that hospitals routinely offer that are simply closed. Um, uh, but there are services that have enormous backlogs now. And so uh, I don't think there's anything that you'd say until further notice, this is not available. But I, I completely understand the issue about uh, services like, for example, as you say, lymphedema, where the backlog is now very substantial and there is the challenge of, 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 uh, uh, of, of how you work through that and get access to that. But, but formally, there isn't anything that we've, we, we haven't got anything closed at the moment. All right. Thank you. I'll Thanks just keep much. waiting then. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, next question is Councillor Boyles. Martin, are you there? Councillor Boyles? Not there. Move on to Councillor Craig. You have a question. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, it was just to ask, really, how long the results take to come back from COVID, or should they? Um, I have forwarded um, an email I've received whilst we're on this um, meeting this morning where somebody's been told 48 hours, then another 36 hours. Um, and I've heard other people saying that they've been told up to a week. So just um, how long should the people be waiting for future reference, please? So my understanding, Councillor Craig, thank you, is that 
Uh, in the main, most results come back within uh, 48 hours. Some come back quicker than that. And as I mentioned earlier, the lab capacity is increasing, so samples are coming back quicker. Some people are unfortunately waiting a little bit longer. So I think if they haven't heard within 48 hours, they should phone the uh, helpline or the email address and follow that up. But my understanding is, and the experience I've had, is that results uh, turnaround is improving uh, dramatically. And I'll answer your email um, in more in fuller in, in, in the next day or so. Yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you very much. Th th thank you, Simon. Um, Councillor Boyles, did, did you have a question? You're still shown as our participant. No. OK. Um, Councillor Dowden, you have another question. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Uh, mine is actually to um, Graham Allen. Um, he reported, and within the report, uh, the obviously the um, survey that was carried out by the Hampshire Care Association. I think that's quite frightening, actually, that 92%, as it is stated, of providers of concerns about their future viability of their businesses. Um, well, of course, a lot of them have had increased costs, significant increased costs. And of course, they have complained for far too long that, um, uh, and I understand the reasons. Oh, sorry, the phone, I just had to, the, the reasons, uh, Chairman, with the um, situation where even the county can't play, can't pay the, 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 the real costs of what it costs for a person to be in their home. And um, it worries me that where we're, they're facing that situation, we could all be facing a terrible situation if a lot more of these homes, as many have, have closed down. And if that is the case, particularly with the COVID, as it could get a uh, spike even further, with particularly with influenza coming in as well. Um, I just, uh, it's a worry. And I don't know how we're going to be able to finance these homes to be able to stay uh, viable, um, unless there is a lot more money that comes from central government. So perhaps uh, Graham Allen can give me some more information of, of what he knows. Perhaps I don't. Yeah, thank, thank you, Councillor Dowden. To, to some degree, we, we need to uh, cast our minds back. So before the pandemic began to hit, the, the national conversation was around a future funding solution for social care, a sector which has been uh, uh, desperately hard hit over an extended period of time. What I would say is, and I, I did make reference as I went through the presentation, in terms of the, the survey or the last survey that Hampshire Care Association undertook, it was at a moment in time and it was back in uh, July. And certainly I think for, for many of those respondents, they were reflecting what they'd experienced over the previous three to four month period. And what we know is um, at the point at which the pandemic began to hit, it had a very significant immediate impact on care home uh, settings in particular. And what we saw as a consequence was the occupancy across care homes reducing very rapidly and very significantly over a short time frame. Now, if we cast our minds back to July, we had seen something in the order of a 15% reduction in the number of occupied uh, beds within the care home sector across Hampshire. That, that's all care homes. So 15% reduction. So quite clearly in, in response to uh, the pandemic, there were a lot of increased costs which were not borne out by the income that care homes were still receiving. And I reference to additional costs around personal protective equipment, PPE. There was a, a, a global uh, clamour in order to obtain appropriate PPE. And uh, the market basically determined what the price would be. And we saw increases in terms of the cost of, of items such as face masks by a factor of up to six. 
Now, that, of course, led to huge increased cost pressures for the sector. And similarly, in terms of staffing costs around those staff that were uh, needing to self-isolate, you can't simply say uh, a member of staff isn't able to turn up to work today, never mind. You need to make sure that you've got sufficient capacity staffing wise in the care home setting to continue to deliver safe and appropriate care to residents. So members of, of the HCA who responded to that survey were absolutely in July reporting those kinds of factors. Alongside that though, what we've seen is a significant amount of money made available both through the commissioned care that we as a local authority have provided and indeed commissioned care through the NHS. And alongside that, the infection prevention and control grant funding. So in total, uh, something close to 60 million pounds in this financial year, over and above what the normal payment rate would be to the care home sector will be paid out. Now, I would, I think, sympathize with a view that said, but that still isn't enough. And I would, would agree with that view, that still wouldn't be enough. But there is a huge amount of support that's gone in, but I think we still face with a structural challenge of the appropriate funding of social care, not only now, but in the medium and the longer term. I hope that that response is, is helpful. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Graham. Uh, just, I just hope there is sufficient money um, that actually does come in because I think it could increase a great deal more yet. That's needed, I mean. Thank you, Graham. Now, the last question will come from Councillor Carpenter, but before then, uh, Councillor Grajewski would like to make a, a, an intervention. She is uh, Director of Public Health. Judith, are you there? No, no, I'm not. Please. No, I'm the Executive Member for Public Health. <laughs> um, <guess>. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Chairman. Um, it is actually a question for Graham Allen, if he could just elaborate a little bit on, on, on the sector position, which we've just been talking about. I mean, obviously, I hear everything that he's saying and agree that we, you know, it's the, the way that social care is provided and funded needs to be explored so that we have a sustainable system um, for the future. However, um, the Hampshire Care Association survey had 62 responses and just looking at the percentages, 92% reporting concerns over future viability um, looks a very high number. But how many surveys were actually done? Um, quite often, if, if surveys uh, do not include all of the data, um, it's, it's a bit like, you know, councillors, when we do our surveys, we tend to get them returned by the people who, uh, who have an issue or have a problem. So I just wondered if you could say a little bit more about that to put it into context. But I'm in no way trying to suggest that there isn't an issue here, but just, you know, can, can we have some perspective on that, please? Yeah, by all means. So, so as I said, so uh, 62 responses. Uh, the survey was sent out, uh, as I understand it, by HCA to all their members, but moreover to all social care providers across Hampshire. That number of providers, including around about 270 Hampshire Care Association members, plus the rest of the sector, would amount to almost a thousand different providers of social care across Hampshire. That's what was important for me to say roughly a thousand uh, survey requests were sent out and these are the results of 62. I'm not a statistician um, and what I'm effectively uh, doing is reporting on the results that were received by a partner organisation. Um, so in terms of their validity, I think the headline comments are uh, worth uh, repeating and reporting, hence my inclusion th this morning. But I think uh, Councillor Grajewski is quite right. We need to see them within a context. Beyond the HCA survey, on a very regular basis, and the reg very regular basis is at least weekly through a national tool which is undertaken by all care providers through every single local authority in the country. We have something called the Care Tracker. And again, it's, it's a tool to which uh, care providers are updating information on a very regular basis. So if I, if I, again, just, just picking one of the areas of concern, one of the areas of concern for the mm -hmm. care home sector was that reduction in occupied beds, which, as I said, was um, in, the, in the spring and early summer, we'd seen an up to 20% reduction in the number of occupied beds. It's important to understand that the financial viability 
of the care home sector really revolves and it will, of course it'll be different provider to provider but the overall the viability of the sector is based on about a 92 percent occupancy level so we saw that that occupancy across hampshire reduced down uh, to 70 uh, to 73 percent at the worst moments as a result of the pandemic it's now at around about 86 to 87 percent so we've seen recovery since that survey was undertaken there are still many challenges but in spite of those many challenges we've seen uh, since the uh, pandemic began to have a, a, an impact and began to uh, hit the sector we've seen one failure of a care home in Hampshire now in a normal year we would expect to see somewhere between four and six care homes make a, either a business decision and that might be because the owners now wish to retire or another decision taken either by the CQC or other bodies including ourselves to bring about a closure of a home because of poor or inappropriate practice so far as a consequence of pandemic of the pandemic we've seen one care home closure as opposed to a normal year somewhere between four and six so at worst uh, the sector is under extreme pressure but i think there's something that we need to, to acknowledge at this committee which is the sector is absolutely focused on the best interests of its residents and our population and despite uh, decisions that might otherwise be made by uh, providers of, of care home settings they are maintaining their provision in the best interests of their residents rather than saying it's time for us to now close because i wish to retire so there is something just fundamentally phenomenal and positive and good that is taking place across the wider social care sector thank you um could i just come back on on on, on that ch uh, chairman um, to say that, uh, yeah, thank you for putting that into context. I'm not a statistician either, but perhaps they, these figures should come with a with a p-value so we we can understand the significance. Um, and just one other point: um, uh, one um, member of the um, uh, um, uh, the, the Hask said earlier, or was asking about um, the way that uh, incidence of cases is moving from the younger. Um, age groups into the older age groups and if i can suggest if anybody hasn't seen them that they google professor jonathan van tam's uh, heat maps um which are are, are wonderful um and uh, he he i think the ones he showed on monday he compared to the ones he'd shown uh, 10 days earlier um and it pictorial it really just shows quite clearly in the regions across the country how um, the, uh, the the virus is moving up now into the older age groups. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Grayeski. Uh, so the last question is is now from Councillor Carpenter. Thank you, Chair. Um, if I could just say as well before the question that all the contrib contributors today, um, it's been such a really valuable and informative meeting. It really has very very good. Um, your, the, uh, the, my question is to Simon, uh, Director of Public Health, and we're putting out uh, very consistent and very good um, messages of social media, little videos to, to tell the public about what they should be doing, um, and they're coming out regularly. Uh, and I've noticed that there is sort of a persistent response um, from some people uh, criticising, not, I'm not saying particularly our messages, it's the national picture really, about hands, face, space, how it's making people overly concerned and they shouldn't be so anxious and that the numbers are much lower and all these things we hear. And I just wondered what um, your view, Simon, what, what your message would be to those people responding in that way to the messaging um, as public director, uh, director of public health, sorry, for Hampshire, for Hampshire people. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Carpenter. I think uh, the first thing I would like to say is, you know, I really want to thank people for taking the messages on and following those. I do know it's really difficult, but it is really, really important that we continue with the social distancing, the face coverings and washing our hands, because actually uh, this, as, I, as I've explained in my presentation, the, the virus is going up. We're not in the place of the Northwest and neither do I want Hampshire to get into that place. But we are seeing cases rising. We're beginning to see hospital emissions. It's really important. Some of the really serious consequences of this 
um, uh, disease was seen in the first wave with uh, people in ITU. And sadly, we saw that increase of um, people dying. And I, we don't want that. So I think uh, you're right. It's really difficult. I understand people are um, perhaps a little bit fed up with following these messages. But from my perspective, it's really, really important. Uh, and I, again, want to thank people who are doing that because I know how hard it is. Uh, we all know personally the way our lives have changed and um, we, we need to keep keep supporting people to be able to manage those uh, different ways of working, our children in different ways of school and our workplaces being different and our, our social and personal lives being different. So yeah, thanks for raising that and I do understand the challenges and really um, urge people to follow the messages. Thank you, Simon. Uh, that, that concludes the questions. Um, I mean, ju just to reiterate, we, we are at war with a virus and we're all combatants of the virus. So we all need to do our thing. And in the case of, of our residents, it's following the rules. And in the case of uh, the people who are serving us, they're also having to follow the rules and do their job. And it's not easy. And everybody, I hope, recognises that. Right. What we now need to do is go through the agenda, starting back at uh, item six and reviewing the recommendations for item six. Just to um, remind you, uh, we are looking at uh, the public health COVID-19 report that Simon has given us and the recommendations are on page 11 and they are to note the current COVID-19 situation and also to note the leadership role of the public health director function and, and his team. Uh, does anyone abstain or dissent from noting those two things? In that case, I can conclude that we are in full agreement to note those two items. So thank you very much indeed, Simon, uh, for your contribution and uh, do give the thanks of the HASC to your team and, and hope that um, the second wave uh, doesn't really happen. But as you know, infections are increasing. Thank you. Right, now the next section was um, uh, Graham Allen's uh, report on adult social care, the, the COVID-19 update. And there we've got a series of recommendations. They are on page 19. Um, and they're quite substantial. So for the benefit of the webcast, I probably ought to read them. Uh, first one is that the Health and Adult Social Care Select Committee notes the work that has taken place to date by adults, health and care, public and voluntary sector organisations and their partners in Hampshire to support the needs of its most vulnerable citizens and the wider community. Uh, are there any abstentions or dissension on noting that? No? Good. Second one is that the Health and Adult Social Care Select Committee is assured by the systems that they have been put in place across Hampshire as set out in the report to support the county's most vulnerable residents as well as the wider community during the COVID-19 academic, uh, uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Are there any dissensions or abstentions for that? No, so we can happily note that. Third one is that the Health and Adult Social Care Select Committee recognises the impacts upon the care home sector and wider social care sector, but is assured by the work underway to support the care home sector. Are there any abstentions or rejections of that? No, then we can note that one. Thank you. Fourth one is that the Health and Social Care Select Committee notes actions taken and currently underway to support moves towards recovery of services, systems and processes across adults, health and care and receive further updates at future meetings. Any dissension or abstention from that? Thank you, members. So we, we have accepted all those proposed recommendations for item seven. So moving swiftly on to item eight, uh, this was the report by our NHS colleagues. Um, it is to note the systems-wide uh, update. 
and to note the temporary closure of the new Forest Birth Centre and request an update in January 21. Uh, the first one to note the system-wide updates, which we receive very comprehensively from the, the team. Uh, are there any dissension or abstention on that? No, good. And then uh, noting the temporary closure of the new Forest Birth Centre. Uh, we had a, a very clear explanation from Suzanne Cunningham why that had to happen. And there is no reason why other um, pregnant women in the area won't be looked after by the system, even though they may need to go to a new location. So uh, I, is there any dissension or abstention on that matter? No, good. So we, we have cleared all of those. Right, um, it's exactly noon. We have been sitting for two hours. Public health uh, recommendations are we shouldn't sit down for more than two hours at a time. So we'll have a 10 minute break and then we'll finish off, off the meeting shortly after that. So I'll see you back here at 10 minutes past 12. Thank you.
Thank you. Welcome back, everyone. We've just got two more items in today's house to deal with. The first one is uh, adult safeguarding, and it's a report by uh, uh, Graham Allen. Uh, Graham, are you ready to present? Thank you, uh, Councillor Huckstep. Uh, so, members, uh, what you have before you is the annual safeguarding update. So this relates to the 2019-20 uh, financial year. This is a report that uh, this committee receives uh, each year at around about this time. Um, I'm going to make a few uh, a few opening comments, but then of course more than happy to take any questions uh, that you may have for me. So within the uh, the body of the report, you will also see a link which will take you to the annual report of the Hampshire Safeguarding Adults Board. Uh, usually that report uh, is produced later in the year. Uh, in my role as chair of the Hampshire Safeguarding Board, I've sought to bring that forward in order to accompany this update uh, to this committee today. Uh, more than happy to take any comments or questions you may have uh, on that report. So in terms of a few comments, uh, you'll see within the report before you that we've recently, uh, as a local uh, adult safeguarding board, appointed to a new role and the new role is that of independent scrutineer. The, um, the usual process uh, across the country for a number of years and indeed was previously the arrangement in Hampshire was to have an independent chair of the Safeguarding Adults Board. Uh, the local authority along with its statutory partners the NHS and the police agreed around about this time last year that we wanted to pursue a slightly different path uh, and we are one of, of two uh, adult safeguarding boards in the country, as I understand it, that are currently operating in this new way. So as Director of Adults uh, Health and Care and as the statutory Director of Adult Social Services, I chair now the uh, Hampshire Safeguarding Adults Board and we've successfully appointed to an independent scrutineer. And that scrutineer role uh, is being filled by somebody called Jane Lawson. Jane uh, was appointed uh, about two months or so ago and is now uh, in that role as independent scrutineer and acts as a critical friend to all of the partners across the safeguarding, uh, uh, adult safeguarding uh, board arrangement. Jane comes to this role here in Hampshire, having held a number of national leadership roles in adult safeguarding. She's also chaired a number of safeguarding boards across England and latterly was working as the professional advisor on the development of adult safeguarding to the local government association. So we're really delighted that we've been able to appoint someone of Jane's calibre to this particular role. Jane is, is working now within the, uh, the structures of the board, getting to, to understand uh, the architecture in terms of the uh, various groups that operate and indeed uh, the programme of activity and the overarching strategy uh, of the board. Um, what I've asked Jane to do in my role as chair is on an annual basis, and this will be done uh, in April and May of each year, is to provide an independent scrutineer's assurance report. And what that will be designed to do is to accompany the safeguarding uh, adults board report, and it will draw out particular themes, particular challenges or things that collectively across the Safeguarding Adults Board we need to do better. So hopefully members you will agree that by bringing a truly independent scrutiny function alongside the work of the board, uh, the intention is to add value as we go forward. I would also say within the report there's a the section on performance. It's important to understand I think in terms of the number of uh, initial concerns that, that come forward each year uh, through our arrangements, the multi-agency safeguarding hub, the MASH, in terms of where individuals, families, the community or indeed partner organisations may have concerns over risks or safeguarding issues relating uh, to individuals. From those initial concerns, we undertake a triage in terms of whether those concerns uh, need to be followed up and turned into what are known as Section 42 inquiries. So a Section 42 is a duty to undertake inquiry in terms of harm 
that may exist to an individual. And the critical thing in terms of the performance is that uh, we've seen over a number of years, a number of mechanisms that we've been able to bring uh, to bear in terms of those concerns that initially get brought forward in terms of successful and positive resolution short of needing to undertake a full Section 42 safeguarding inquiry. And what we refer to within the body of the report is the conversion rate. So the number of initial concerns that get converted into a Section 42 inquiry. And what we see in the 2019-20 uh, financial year is that conversion rate is standing at 28%. In the previous year, it was around about 35%. So we've seen a modest reduction in the number of initial concerns that need to be taken through to a safeguarding inquiry. Now that's an important point because if the system becomes overwhelmed with treating everything as a safeguarding inquiry, there won't be sufficient capacity in order to do justice to those matters that should be formally taken through that route. So it's something we take a very close uh, eye upon year on year and indeed month by month. Beyond that, I just wanted to say that what we have seen and we've reflected it in the report is that as the uh, impact of the pandemic began to be felt, particularly from the beginning of April, we have seen certainly over the first four to five months of this year, an upsurge in the number of concerns that have come forward. And many of those con concerns have converted into Section 42 inquiries. Members will, will absolutely appreciate the amount of stress and distress that have been built up amongst families, particularly, I would say, those people in receipt of health and social care support in terms of those normal services having been curtailed. Members may also have seen a recent report uh, by one of the charitable uh, sector organisations, Alzheimer's UK, and Carers UK, which identified that in the first four months of this year, some 60 million additional hours of informal care have been provided by family carers, neighbours and friends to people requiring ongoing support. So there is a huge or there has been a huge amount of need out there that normal services operating in a normal way have not been able to reach and to some degree that's why we've seen greater numbers of concerns coming forward in the first part of this year. Positively, we've started to see uh, those numbers of initial inquiries starting to reduce as lockdown has eased. But moreover, we've also seen a huge stepping up from all partner agencies in terms of the support that's been available across our communities, particularly in some key areas, including those people at risk of domestic abuse, but also in terms of people that may be uh, unfortunately subject uh, to scams, either through uh, phone calls or indeed uh, scams that have been run over the internet. And we do know that lockdown has brought a huge upsurge in the number of people going online for a whole range of services, information and support. So working with colleagues in trading standards and other services, including Hampshire Constabulary, We've been very alert to that. Uh, I'll, I'll stop there, but more than happy to, to take any comments or indeed any questions. Thank you, Graham, for that uh, comprehensive run through your report. Uh, are there any questions from members? We don't sorry. have... Oh, sorry. No, no questions? I think yes. Councillor Harrison wishes to ask a question. Councillor Harrison. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I certainly um, share the concerns about the number of scams. I, I guess I'm not the only member who's um, had a lot of telephone calls from uh, people trying to get me to do things with my computer um, that should never be done with a computer. Um, and and I, I think it's really um, uh, very useful for all of us to communicate um, to as many people as we can just how many fraud attempts there are out there. 
Um, and, you know, it's certainly increased since the pandemic started. Uh, but my question, uh, if you'll indulge me, Chairman, is about support for that army of people who are informal carers. Um, I think there's been, a, a, rightly, a lot of focus on supporting vulnerable people in all sorts of ways, but there must be enormous stresses above and beyond what would normally be the case for those people who are stuck with caring for relatives. And I, I wonder whether Graham uh, thinks that we, we are doing enough or whether we could do more to support the carers. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Harrison. Re really uh, good question. I, I would I would start by saying I think there is always more support that can be provided uh, to informal carers, whether they be family members, uh, neighbours or friends. We have put in place and, and um, to, to, to a large degree, the, the pandemic has, has acted as a catalyst, but also enabled us to establish new carer support board arrangements. So there is now a carers board, which is operating under the, uh, the wider uh, remit of co-production across the department, but linking uh, with all uh, sector uh, partners to provide dedicated support to carers. I think one of the issues that we are particularly uh, cognizant of, because it's been a particular challenge that has come forward, is younger adults with learning disabilities who live uh, with family members and the curtailment of many of those usual services, including things like day opportunities and also respite provision. Now, as we covered earlier on the, the adult health and care update, we have seen the ability to turn back on many of those services, albeit um, in quite a careful way and in a way that is not yet at a, at a point where it's able to support all of those uh, young people and those families who hitherto would have been attending those kinds of services. It's been targeted at those at greatest need. And we've also, across the, the response to the pandemic, not only through our own services and those organisations that we contract to provide support uh, to carers and informal carers, we've also worked with, with community voluntary sector partners and also the NHS to ensure that we've been able to outreach and by outreaching, we are, uh, you know, working to support people in, in their own homes, hopefully on the basis of giving carers some respite and the opportunity uh, to, to maybe go out, get some fresh air, to take a break from those kinds of caring responsibilities. It is a, a huge challenge for those informal carers. We absolutely recognise it. We are working hard and we will continue to work harder into that space, but it is a key risk that we're very much alert to. Thank you, Graham. Uh, Councillor Carew. Thank you, Chairman. Graham, um, as you, you may be aware, my mother died during the first lockdown and we were very well served by County Council funded carers. Um, they were a separate agency, but obviously paid for by the, the County Council largely. Um, my question really is um, about following on from Councillor Harrison is whether um, at the beginning um, it was obviously an unknown sort of situation. Um, as a, a full time carer, I had to purchase things like face masks and hand gel. Um, but I, I'm concerned as to what the situation is regarding other carers and families who look after people who perhaps like my mother are um, completely bedridden and are they supposed, supposed to provide their own um, hand gel and masks for carers um, or just for their own selves. My other question is um, with the people who are doing the caring who are largely young and female um, I must say that they seem to look after an awful lot of people. And by doing so, obviously, they're moving between households. Have we now got a system in place with best practice guidance um, to ensure, for example, that they all wear masks 
uh, and they all all wash their hands um, once they're within the house or, or upon entering a house, just to to make sure that that potential link with COVID is broken. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Councillor Carew. And, and firstly, my, my, my sympathies uh, in okay. terms of your loss. Um, in terms of, of what we have, um, I, I think there are a number of elements really to, to, to both parts of your, your two questions, if, if I may. So in terms of informal carers looking, looking after a loved one, whoever that may be, then of course uh, there is an awful lot of information, advice, and indeed where required, access to uh, 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 PPE and other materials to ensure that the care can be delivered in an appropriate way. With regard to, to, to family carers or indeed informal carers, um, the key point is that if somebody is, is concerned about the, the potential risk of, of COVID transmission, then of course we would be saying, please don't be providing that intimate personal care unless you've got the appropriate PPE. And even in those circumstances, please, if you're unsure, ask for further advice and information. We have that both through uh, our adult social services uh, contact points, but also through our public health colleagues. And indeed, there's a wealth of information available, uh, most of it based on the prevailing government advice in terms of how to stay COVID safe. In, in regard to your second question about domiciliary care agencies, I think it's huge credit and we must give huge credit to domiciliary care agencies because we have seen very, very few cases of any transmission through domiciliary care uh, provision across Hampshire and indeed uh, more, more widely across the country through the provision of domiciliary care. One of the, the factors for that, I would say, is that one of the big issues for personal care uh, providers of any kind, whether that be domiciliary care or indeed care home settings, has been the attempt, attention historically and currently to infection prevention and control. COVID-19 is, is yet the latest manifestation of the kinds of risks that people who are vulnerable will face. And, and indeed, as we go into flu season, the advice around COVID is as relevant in terms of good basic hygiene control and indeed where necessary access to PPE. Very positively, we've seen over the course of this summer, the challenges that initially manifested in terms of the availability of PPE have largely been removed because there is now a national uh, uh, PPE portal that all registered providers of social care services can access and obtain personal protective equipment free of charge if their usual supply is not available to them. So we have seen um, massive positive progress in terms of the availability of PPE, almost now to the point where uh, we have sufficient PPE, where given the reasonable worst case scenario, excluding acute hospitals and elements of the healthcare services, which would see the utilization of PPE at a very high rate, but across social care settings, there is arguably, arguably sufficient PPE already available in Hampshire, should it be needed, to deal with the reasonable worst case scenario to make PPE widely available. But largely speaking, it's there, it's available, and it's free of charge to all providers. Wonderful. Thank you, Graham. Um, Thank you. I, I have a question. Um, the NHS set up in conjunction with the Royal Voluntary Service a set of uh, people numbering hundreds of thousands who um, basically call and check on people how, how they're doing and I'm just wondering is that something that we could make use of for uh, voluntary carers as a first line of support for them? So, so thank, thank you for the question. To, to, to some degree, I think that, that really takes us back to elements of, of the welfare uh, response that, that we covered earlier, rather than, than the safeguarding uh, issues. One of the things that, that we are very conscious of, and it, it's been one of the things that we have made sure that we've put in place and, and very diligently 
been observing throughout the response to the pandemic is that we saw a huge upswell in terms of uh, volunteering across communities, what I would refer to as, as informal uh, volunteering in terms of people uh, seeking to support uh, people within their, their uh, local communities, close neighbours and others. Working with voluntary community sector partners, but also uh, some of the uh, uh, NHS call for uh, volunteers, we've worked closely to ensure that we've got appropriate safeguards around uh, informal caring and also around volunteers that have come forward. So one of the things that we've been very conscious of, and I, I will uh, make this link, but I make no particular comment. One of the things that has been a particular risk has been the risk of uh, vulnerable people uh, to all kinds of different scams. And we've wanted to, to make sure there's an appropriate um, support mechanism in place for volunteers. And luckily across Hampshire, it's one of the things that Hampshire needs to be, I would suggest, very proud of, is we saw a huge army of people come forward acting as volunteers through our formal volunteering organisation, some 4,000 people. The national call for NHS volunteers, little of that capacity needed to be drawn upon across Hampshire. But it's not to say that those people that volunteered to the NHS call weren't already volunteering uh, and working with other local organisations. So we've absolutely made uh, use of that voluntary sector capacity. Some of the outreach that we've done, as I made mention earlier, uh, outreach that we've uh, provided uh, to individuals, to families, to keep them safe, has come from that voluntary community sector support mechanism that we've got. So in short, yes, we have made use of the voluntary community sector, less so the NHS volunteer workforce, which was in initially called for to support with uh, practical tasks such as medications, collection and delivery. Uh, again, to our credit across our communities, we had many, many groups already able to fill that space. It's not to say that those volunteered for the national programme weren't also those local volunteers that were able to use. Thank you, Graham. Um, I don't see any more uh, questions for, for Graham, so we can move to the recommendations, which you can find on page 43. Uh, we've got five of them. Um, the first one is that Health and Adult Social Care Select Committee receives this annual update report related to adult safeguarding and notes it will be received by Cabinet on the 24th of November. I think I can presume there are no abstentions or dissension on, on that. Second is that the Health and Adult Social Care Select Committee note the positive progress with regards to safeguarding adults in Hampshire and the commitment of a wide range of adult services officers in achieving this level of performance. Uh, I don't think we have any dissension or abstention on that. So that recommendation is held. Third one is that uh, the HASC note the developments and risks in relation to the remit of our local authority statutory duty to safeguard and keep the vulnerable adults safe from abuse and or neglect. Again, I don't expect any abstention or dissension of that. Thank you. That the HASC note the contribution of the Hampshire Safeguarding Adults Board in leading the development of policy across the four local authority areas of Hampshire, Portsmouth, Southampton and the Isle of Wight, including the Hampshire Safeguarding Adults Board annual report for 2019-20. No abstentions or dissensions of that. Thank you. And the final one is that the Health and Adult Social Care Select Committee receive a further update on adult safeguarding in 12 months time. No abstentions or dissension on that. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. In fact, thank you to all the presenters of uh, the items on our agenda today. Uh, I note that our NHS colleagues, I think, have, have, have logged off, but we'll be writing to them separately, thanking them for their contributions. So the final item on the agenda, item 10, is the work programme. To consider and approve the work programme and a reminder that members that topic suggestions can be sent by email to me 
uh, for the next agenda item meeting. Now, uh, we've had one topic come up today uh, as a result of a personal experience by uh, Councillor Craig. I, I just wonder whether we ought to have a, a look at uh, the NHS 111 service. It may be that it's simply uh, a, a, a hiccup in, in, in demand uh, uh, overnight last night. On the other hand, there may be an underlying problem. So I think it's behove of this committee at least to find out one or the other. And, and if there is an underlying problem, I think it probably should be uh, an item in our work programme. Does anyone want to comment on that or agree? Agreed, Chairman. Agreed. Agreed. Good, thank you. Are there any other items that we should include in the work programme arising from today's meeting or at any other stage in your thinking? You know the mechanism to do it. In that case, ladies and gentlemen, I can declare this current task closed. Thank you very much for all your contributions and uh, we'll see you again in November. Thank you.